This is Ashley Hodge with the Sikkim 365 podcast. All Sikkim 365 basketball content brought to you by Syntex Bookkeeping. For all your payroll, bookkeeping, and accounting needs, Syntex Bookkeeping is your source. Run by some great bears. I'm joined by Grayson Grunhafer, and I'm calling him from Indianapolis. I'm, I'm here f- for the uh, great game against Villanova on Saturday and then staying through the uh, big matchup tonight with Arkansas. So we're going to break that down a little bit. We're going to talk about the Elite Eight matchups in general, and but we're mostly going to focus on the Baylor-Arkansas matchup tonight. Grayson, how are you feeling? What do you, what do you think is going to go on tonight at uh, Lucas Oil Stadium? Yeah, I'm excited to watch this game, to be honest. I mean, obviously, it's an Elite Eight opportunity. We talked, um, I guess, a few days ago about how we both kind of thought the Villanova game was the, I guess, trickier matchup of what they were going to face in the Elite Eight. So I stand by that. Right. You know, after watching Arkansas versus Oral Roberts, it's really the same the same team that I saw against Texas Tech and against Colgate. So I'm not really seeing them take huge strides in the tournament. Um, you know, just a few quick facts that I, I think really favor Baylor in this matchup. I mean, Arkansas is 144th in the country in turnovers. They are extremely lackadaisical with the basketball. Right. They don't really have a true point guard, in my opinion, like a guy who really initiates the offense and sets the table for them. Yep. Um, they, they just kind of spread the ball around. So 12.8 turnovers a game. I mean, and that's against, you know, who knows the competition, you know, most nights. I mean, there, there's some fluctuations there. So there's a chance Baylor could force Arkansas to turn the ball over quite a few times. Um, the other key stat that I'll note, that's kind of interesting and I don't really know how to take it. So I'm curious your opinion on it, but Arkansas hasn't made more than five, three pointers in a tournament game so far. And the one they did was against Colgate in which they scored 85 points. They only made five threes. They made one against Oral Roberts and four against Texas tech. Um, They're shooting the ball terribly from out there and they're really not shooting it a ton. And they haven't shot over 45% in a single tournament game. So it's odd because they've scored 85, uh, 72, and I believe 68 against Texas Tech. So they're still somehow scoring because they're rebounding and getting in the lane, but it's not due to any efficiency whatsoever, which I find really kind of, kind of bizarre. Yeah, that that is a bizarre stat. And I knew coming into the uh, sweet 16 matchups, I'd done the research on that. I knew they were not a great three point shooting team. They're only uh, 33% for the year, 188th in Ken Palm, at least the day that I put those stats up. And Baylor obviously is 41%. And coming off a really poor shooting game, uh, Arkansas, if you believe the theory that it helps to play in a gym, especially a gym that's that's very large like the Lucas Oil Stadium, Baylor's already played in Lucas Oil Stadium. Arkansas has not. All their games so far have been in other venues. So maybe that will help Baylor today. Uh, but obviously that didn't help Baylor already having played in Hinkle. Villanova had already played in Hinkle as well. And both those teams shot pretty poorly from three point range uh, Saturday. But, you know, I, I do think um, there's some advantages that Baylor can exploit. You know, number one, Arkansas plays freshman guards. You know, they, they start two freshman guards. And although Scott Drew said in his pregame presser that at this time of year, you're not really freshman anymore. And I believe that. I still don't think they've probably seen the type of defense, the type of pressure that Baylor's going to throw at them. Texas Tech maybe gave them a little bit of a taste of that. And and they weren't that efficient, you know, offensively against Texas Tech. Having said that, you know, Drew also mentioned that they've won 12 of their last 13 coming into this game. So they're they're on a roll. Uh, They've only lost to LSU in the uh, SEC tournament. A lot of close games. They haven't beat like a murderer's row, but they did beat Alabama. They beat Alabama convincingly 81 to 66 during that stretch. So I, I, I do think that it's not a game that you just want to chalk up in the W column. Obviously all the teams left are, are hot teams and, and good teams. Uh, but if Baylor plays their game, I, you know, Ken Palm says that Baylor wins 72% of the time. I, I really feel that, you know, this is a game Baylor wins 90% of the time. You know, if it not if they had ten matchups, Baylor's going to win nine of these. Right, would, would you agree with that assessment? That's that's a bold take. 
Um, you know, it's the elite eight. I, you know, I, I'd probably be safer saying eight out of 10. Um, okay. Just, and you know, I think a part of it, and, and it's really tough right now, but like Jared Butler's got to play better. And oh, yeah. I mean, if Jared Butler's going to be playing like he has been, I mean, yeah, they could lose two or three times out of 10. Um, and I know that's still, a, I mean, a compliment to Baylor that they could beat this team without Jared Butler playing well. Um, but I'm a huge proponent that if this team is going to reach their ultimate goals he has to play better and I I think this is an opportunity for him to really um, you know get Baylor to the final four turn the tide a little bit of his NCAA tournament uh, run and really help them get there and I I do believe they're going to need him to play very well um, because Arkansas does have some long rangy defenders they're probably going to deploy a pretty big defender to put on Davion Mitchell Um, to utilize their length a little bit Um, and you know they might do it to Jared too and honestly I I think Villanova's length at times really was a problem for Jared he couldn't get shots up he seemed you know after he got it blocked uh, one shot blocked by Slater he just didn't really want to shoot threes anymore he kind of I think lost a little bit of confidence plus he had missed quite a few so I'm curious if he's able to find a formula to combat that or if it's more of the same, but um, you know, he's got to continue to be aggressive. I've said for a while, I think he is their best player and probably their most important player to reach the ceiling that they want to go to win a national championship. I I think he's the most important. So uh, this is a big step in that direction, Um, but Arkansas has got some athletes, like you said, but they are young. And so hopefully Jared can take advantage of that. Yeah. And and I'm going to make this comment. You know, I, I think Macy Oteague needs to hunt his shot a little more. I think he only took six uh, shot attempts in that game. And it seemed to me, watching the replay, that, you know, Jared and Davion got stuck with the ball in their hands at the end of the shot clock and had to put up shots that aren't really shots that you want to, you know, put up in, in, in the flow of the offense. So, so I do think that, you know, you could probably attribute – four or five of those missed three pointers to that type of situation where it's like, you're stuck with the ball at the hand of the end of the shot clock. You got to get a shot up. And then all of a sudden, you know, just like the block shot was that situation. Uh, you know, so I, I do think that, um, you know, if, if they do a better job of hunting shots, Matthew Meyer doesn't have any problem with that. He'll hunt his shot. <laughs> Zero <laughs> but Adam, problem. But Adam Flagler and Maceo need to be aggressive and, and, the, and they can't turn down good looks. They're too good of a, sh- you know, shooters uh, to turn down good looks. Uh, so hopefully we'll see that today because those yeah. guys are really efficient offensively. And Ashley, I also wanted to say to that point, you know, a lot of times defenses are going to really hone in on Mitchell and Butler. Yep. And I think we saw it against Nova. Teague had great matchups and, and right. he's going to have good matchups in the tournament. So I think right. that's a great point. And I mean, he's going to be able to get to the rim. If he goes to the foul line, he's a very good foul shooter as yeah. well. So yeah. he does need to take advantage of the defensive matchups that he's right. given because they're probably going to be weaker than what Butler and Mitchell are having to, to do. Yeah. With yeah. Ball. No, great point. When you're one and two on the scouting report, then, you know, you know, Teague is a guy that can really feast and, and certainly Flagler as well. Uh, so, it, you know, this this is, I think, a key thing we need to look for tonight. Uh, let, let's talk about some of the individual matchups. You know, uh, Devontae Davis, he's number four, right? Yeah. Yeah, he so he had game the game-winning winner. shot. He had the game-winning shot. He can't shoot it from the outside, but he's got unbelievable hops. He hangs in the air. He makes difficult shots. He takes a lot of ill-advised shots. I mean, I, I've seen him, you know, throughout the year when I've watched Arkansas, you know, they're, you know, he and Moody and, and really most of the team, even Jalen Tate, are, are quick to, you know, put up some contested twos or, or some, you know, one foot inside the three uh, two-pointers. Their shot selection is not the best, and I think that's where Baylor can really exploit them because if they start taking bad shots and Baylor gets the defensive rebounds and gets out in transition, you know, if they can, if they can win the transition battle, like they did against Villanova 22 to four off of transition points, it's curtains. I I don't see how Arkansas wins this game. If they don't win the battle of transition points, would you agree with that? 
I would, because that's how they got a lot of their points. Um, that's really how they made their run against Colgate, who turned the ball over like 22 yeah. times against Arkansas. But um, yeah, no, you're right. And I think that's a, a very valid point to bring up. These guys want to run. They want to get out in transition. They want to speed the game up. The issue for them is they're, if they start doing that, they will turn the ball over. Right. And Baylor forces turnovers and Baylor scores off turnovers, sometimes threes off turnovers. Yep. Arkansas is just going to be trying to attack the room and get layups in transition. So that's going to be an interesting matchup for sure to see how that kind of plays out. I will say, you know, if you look at their roster, some of their guys, so Jalen Tate has kind of impressed me over the past, I guess, two matchups. Um, He's a veteran. Yep. And that's what kind of scares me about him a little bit. He's not as big as Samuels for Villanova, but they kind of play the same way. He wants to post you up. He wants to get into the lane. He wants to finish physically in the paint. I mean, he did that relentlessly down the stretch against Oral Roberts. Um, He's a rebounder at times. He's a passer at times. He's a very good defender. Um, So he does a lot of things for them. But like you said, not very efficient. Um, None of these guys really are. You're not going to hear either of us say, man, He's a really efficient scorer. Right. Um, if there was one you would say that about, it's probably Moses Moody. Um, and those two guys, Moody and Tate, both 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, kind of combo guard guys who um, defend well, can get into the passing lane, make life tough, um, and then also can score in the paint and rebound. So those are the two guys I'm really most concerned with. Everyone else, if they get contributions from them um, – well, okay, I guess, you know, that's not really fair because Smith is probably going to be another big mismatch in the paint um, at times. But I guess outside their big three. I don't think they'll play him. But I, I mean, I think they're going to use him. Oh, no, Justin Smith. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking yeah. Jalen Williams. Um, yeah, Justin Smith, obviously, Mark has to, you know, try to win that battle because because he's a hard guy to keep off the glass. He's He scores a lot of his points around the rim, very active. I mean, yeah, he's he's the one guy that concerns me the most because I think our backcourt's going to do a good job of frustrating their guards and and making life difficult for them, just like they've done to every backcourt, you know, the last two years. You know, Jalen Williams uh, starts for them, but kind of like Flo Thamba, he's probably not going to see significant minutes. They they like to go to the bench and bring uh, Sills and, and Note off the bench, and and uh, Note is a guy that's averaged thirteen points a game. Uh, so he's been a big producer for them, you know, coming off the well, you know, he started, I think, a lot of the year, but he's coming off the bench now. But, you know, I do, I do like, I like Baylor's advantage off the bench. I like, um, if Mark Vidal can neutralize Justin Smith, I feel good about Baylor's chances of winning because, because ultimately Baylor's backcourt is, is better and more experienced. And, you know, unless all four guys have bad games, you know, if you get two of those four guys getting their normal game, then it should bode well for the Bears. Yeah, and if you want to just kind of a weird stat, you mentioned uh, J.D. Note. So get this stat line. So he's 13 points per game, like you said. Right. He's shooting 37% from the floor, 33% from three. Right. And he's somehow averaging 13 points a game because he shoots the ball 11 times a game despite not being a good shooter. I don't know how that works. I guess he is getting to the free throw line, but my goodness. I mean, at, at some point, when are you telling the dude, hey, don't don't shoot anymore? Can we, can we pass the ball? Just crazy. Yeah. Now that I said this, he's probably going to go five for eight from three or something. But <laughs> He's a volume um, guy. And, and, and if you look at his offensive ratings, it's all across the map. Like, like he had during their winning streak in um, February, all the games in February, they haven't lost a game uh, – the only game they've lost is the LSU game since February 1st. But in February, his offensive ratings were all below 100. And then he had three good games against South Carolina A&M, but then against Missouri in the first round of the SEC tournament, he scored 27 points. He was four for seven from three, had a great game, followed it up with a, with a dud against uh, LSU, played okay against Colgate, had 14 points. But the last two games, Texas Tech and Oral Roberts, 55 offensive rating, 53 offensive rating. His minutes went down in the Oral Roberts game. So that that's something to watch. He he will turn it over. You know, so I, I you know, he could be a guy that maybe, maybe Musselman doesn't trust him as yeah. much in, in this game because, you know, we're 
going to defend them a lot like Texas Tech defends, and he didn't play very well against uh, the, the Red Raiders. What do you think Baylor needs to score? I said 75 against Villanova to win. Obviously, that was woefully wrong. You know, we end up winning 62 to 51. But, but do you think Baylor can win another really low scoring game? Or do you think the Bears really need to get in the 70s? I mean, what's your what's your thought on that? I, I, it's just so confusing that Arkansas has been able to score basically 70 points every game. Right. Despite not shooting the ball. It's just, it's odd. So I, I think that my takeaway from that is that Baylor's probably going to have to score at least high 60s, low 70s to win. Um, but I, I think they're going to score more than that, personally. Yeah. I, I think this is a game where Baylor – you had your really tough challenge against Nova, didn't shoot the ball well. I just I just think something's going to change a little bit in this game. I think they're going to play a little bit more loose. Um, right. I know you have an opportunity to go to the Final Four, but it, it's just different. That first game of the weekend, trying to get into a rhythm, I just I, I really think that they're going to play much better on the offensive end. And I, Arkansas, just, I, they don't have a ton of firepower unless they just come out and just shoot like they haven't all year. So – Right. Um, yeah, I think if they score high 60s, low 70s, they should be able to win this game. But, yeah, I think they'll score a little bit more. Yeah, Arkansas's defense is outstanding. Number eight in Ken Palm. The Bears are 27. Uh, but, you know, the Bears were top five before the COVID pause and, and certainly looking more like the team that is a top five defensive team in this NCAA tournament. Uh, you know, so that's uh, – Arkansas is not as efficient on the offensive end. 45th, Baylor, Baylor Bears are number three. Uh, the, the Bears um, do a you know tremendous job under Scott Drew ever since Rico Gathers set foot on campus. The Bears have been one of the best offensive rebounding teams really before that. You know, the Quincy ACs of the world, they were they were a great offensive rebounding team. Number six in offensive rebounding efficiency, Arkansas is 65. I thought they would have been a lot higher just watching them play because it seems like, especially against Oral Roberts, they just feasted on second chance opportunities and, and offensive rebounding opportunities. But, but Oral Roberts is really weak in that area. And so is Baylor, you know, Baylor's that's the weakness is we're not a good defensive rebounding team, number 265 in defensive rebounding. So we got to be better there. You know, I think, I think we'll show up for that, you know, in the, in the, in these next few games, but uh, you, the evidence would say that that's a, that's a weakness for us. All right. So we, we did this for Villanova. I'm going to test your knowledge of Arkansas basketball. Name me five Arkansas basketball Ooh. players from the past. Oh, this one is – oh, man, this one's a lot tougher, isn't it? Uh, can we name football players? <laughs> <laughs> um, man, they had some good teams, but I, I, I don't even know if I can name – I don't even know if I can name, like, any – Three. <laughs> Holy cow. I'll, I'll, I'll name five. I'll name five for you and, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw an additional five. I mean, this was, this was the time I was at Baylor. So it's easier for me because those teams came to the Farrell center, Todd day, Lee Mayberry, Oliver Miller. Um, who do we have? Andrew Lang. We had uh, Corliss Williamson, their national championship team. Who was a uh, Scotty Thurman was the, was the uh, small forward on that team That's that hit weird. big shots, and then uh, then you you fast forward uh, to more recent years. You have uh, who is was it Rodney Clark, the kid that transferred to Butler. Rodney Clark, the, the sharpshooter, yeah, yeah uh, guard. Weird. He yeah. comes to mind. Oh. Well, I got I got to shout out Brandon Dean. He's he's my he's my guy. He he was all SEC third team under Nolan Richardson, and he um well, this is a funny pickup basketball story. So I'm playing pickup basketball, and he's a great player. He played professionally, played for the Globe Trotters, was all SEC, won the slam dunk competition at at six two in college, and so you know just incredibly athletic. But by the time I'm playing him, he's in his thirties. He's like he's probably 40, 40 years old now, or maybe even over 40, but um, I get caught on a switch with him. He crosses me over. I stayed with it. I stayed with the first one. He crosses me over again, and I stayed with the second one. He does a triple crossover, which really isn't fair, you know, in pickup basketball. <laughs> and so it was so quick, I fell down. And instead of finishing the move, 
he goes, man, check up and just check the ball up. Like the ultimate disrespect. Right. And yeah. I was like, why'd you do that? And he's like, cause I can, you know, <laughs> and <laughs> we know each other pretty well. And, and I actually, um, my game's nowhere near the caliber of game of his, but my, my mouth is probably equally effective. So we, we talk <laughs> a lot of trash to each other, but, uh, in fact, I was, uh, you know, I, I asked him, I said, you want to come on a podcast with uh, Grayson and I He's like, Oh, I don't know the roster well enough. Um, he, wow. he follows them, but not as closely. He was a Mike Anderson guy. And Mike Anderson was famous for this quote. He said, uh, this was one of the best all-time quotes. I think it was in Missouri he did it. They, they said, um, how's the 40 minutes of hell working out? And he said, well, right now it's like 32 minutes of hell, and it's eight minutes of what the hell are we doing? You know, <laughs> so he's like, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's a work in progress. And, you know, and I kind of feel that way with Arkansas, this Arkansas team, they can be really good for 30, 35 minutes, but then it seems like there are five to eight minute stretches in the game where they just go brain dead. Like if you watch them, I've only watched them five or six times this year, but it just seems like they have those stretches where you're just like, what is this team doing? They're just like making terrible, taking terrible shots or turning the ball over. Right. But yeah, it's, it's freshman, freshman. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You're exactly right with that. They, they do. And they go through stretches where they can't score, where they turn the ball over. Baylor's got to take advantage of that. And man, I, I am so bummed. I can't name a single Arkansas Razorback. The only one I can think of, and see, I don't even know if he went there is the problem, but it, didn't, have, didn't they have like uh, the, the guy in, um, he was in Chicago. He's kind of a, a head case a little bit. He's in the league. Um, well, Patrick big, Beverly, Patrick Beverly's another one, Patrick Beverly, but big guy. I'm thinking big guy, like six nine, stretch forward. Oh, Bobby Portis, yes, he yeah, Bobby Portis, yeah, yeah, he went to Arkansas, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there'll be like a ton that will come to mind after this podcast is over, I'm sure. Like, yeah. especially if you look at our NBA rosters, you're gonna go, How did I forget that guy, right? But yeah, they, I mean, Nolan Richardson had it rolling. I mean, that those early 90 teams were terrific. And, and I can't believe I'm not thinking of more guys off of those early 90 teams, especially the one that won the, the national championship. But uh, others oh, in, in Patrick Beverly's uh, or Bra- uh, not Beverly, uh, Pat Bradley, white sharpshooter. They, I think he does some Phil 68 uh, network stuff. He does. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, there's a lot. They've had a lot of great players. What a tradition for them. And it's, it is a little embarrassing that we're not coming up with more names. But, uh, <laughs> Hey, we're a Baylor centric podcast. They're not in our league anymore. You know, so we, uh, you know, you have to go back to the days when they were in the old Southwest conference to really think about some of those memories from the past. Well, we're the triplets, uh, Daryl Walker, uh, Sidney Moncrief. Yeah. Um, that's like their best team ever, isn't it? Ronnie Brewer was Ronnie Brewer. The third, I think that, I think he was the third triplet. Yeah. Yeah. Eddie Sutton had him rolling Joe mm-hmm. Klein. That, that was a guy um, I, I had my best friend. Uh, we would, we would try to insult each other on the pickup basketball court and we would pick players of the same race. He was black. I was white. We'd play one-on-one and he would always call me Joe Klein because he would be like, you're a little step slow. And Joe Klein was like this lumbering big guy, even though he's six eleven. And I would always call him Dallas Comages, a, a DePaul player that was a good player, but not a great player. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we would always kind of trash talk each other, with, uh, <laughs> random like uh, comparisons like that. And, and mine was the was Joe Klein. There you so, go. Yeah. All right. Anything else we want to talk about? Let's let's do the matchups. Uh, how are we doing in the pick'em? Are uh, are you ahead right now? No, you're up one. You're up one. <laughs> oh, just the one. Roberts. The Oral Roberts Arkansas one. You got so you got that one. You got the Florida State. You took Michigan, Michigan over Florida State, and then and I got USC. Back. Yeah, I got yeah. USC. You got Oregon, dude. I, we went to that USC game last night, and I mean Baylor showed out for the Villanova game. I don't know if you could tell on television, but there were probably if there was fifteen hundred people in that arena, I would say there was eight hundred Baylor fans. Maybe, maybe I'm overestimating it a little bit, but. But, you know, it was a good showing. It was a good showing. At that Oregon-USC game, there may have been 700 butts in seats, and I think the capacity was far above that. And Oregon and USC, I, I mean, I, I'm just guessing, but 
maybe 300 fans between the two, the two schools. Wow. I mean, it was pretty funny. I, we were looking for tickets and we were like, Oh, these are really cheap. And you know, so we just went to the game. It was at uh, bankers, which is a really cool venue. Jason King and I had been to a game at bankers to watch Illinois Baylor play, but it was under construction. They had like dust everywhere. It was kind of dirty from the construction and to see it like in, in, you know, shined up, I guess you could say it was yeah. pretty cool. I was impressed. I mean, I thought bankers was an awesome venue to watch a game, but uh, yeah, they, the PAC 12 is not showing up uh, their fan base, you know, so that could bode well. We might want to root for PAC 12 teams to continue to survive in advance. Cause well, there's only two left, right? Three UCLA four, Oregon state, Oregon state, UCLA, USC or three. Three. Yeah. Yeah, USC, Oregon State, and UCLA. Right. They've shown up this tournament already. Their fans haven't, but the teams have. <laughs> the, the apathy among the fans was strong. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I've already got a bias against USC now because going out of the game, I, I you know, saw some USC fans. I was like, man, you guys look great. You know, good luck against the Zags. Beat the Zags. And they go – and they turn around and go, go Hogs. And I was oh. like, okay. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> we had Baylor gear on, of course, but uh, so all right. So, so uh, lead eight matchups. Who do you got? Baylor, Arkansas. Uh, I got Baylor, and I think Baylor is gonna cover. I think it's uh, minus seven right yep. now. I think. So yeah, I think they cover. Uh, I'm looking at a score, probably something like. I don't want to overvalue scoring because we did that last time, but I'll probably say seventy-seven to sixty-eight. Baylor. Yeah. Okay. I've got, I got the bears 82 to 68. I think the bears make a statement this game. Arkansas had a great season, bright future under Musselman, terrific coach. Just don't think they have the horses to, to get it done on this stage. And I think the bears win this game by double digits. All right. We got uh, Houston and um, Oregon state, the surprising run mm. of the Oregon state Beavers. Man, oh man, Houston looked a lot better in this their last game, but Oregon State beat the team that I actually thought was kind of the the best team in it. But I'm gonna chalk that up to Loyola didn't play well and couldn't make shots, right? As opposed to giving all the credit to Oregon State, even though I kind of want to pick them, I got to go with Houston. I think Kelvin Sampson will have those guys ready, and Houston will be in the Final Four. As crazy as that sounds. Yeah, me too. I think I think Oregon State, the advantage here is Kelvin Sampson is a terrific coach. And, you know, I it makes me nervous to think about him having four or five days to prepare for us. It should make them nervous thinking Scott Drew and staff have four or five days to prepare for them. But uh, I think Houston gets it done. I think Oregon State does have the advantage of the quick turnaround here. And, um, you know, Houston – I mean, they're kind of one of those teams that just throws up shots and goes and gets them. I mean, they're a terrific offensive rebounding team, but uh, they're very athletic, great defensively, obviously. Uh, so I think they frustrate Oregon State. And they got the Kansas defect who they could have really used this year. Quentin, <laughs> yeah. Grimes. <laughs> Quentin Grimes. All right, so our next one is uh, Gonzaga USC. Man, did that dunk by Mobley yesterday? Was it's that unbelievable? USC's he's done over the past two <laughs> games has been – they got, perfection. they got screech shooting shots from the three point range with that crazy form. They've got, I mean, they, yeah, they're good. I mean, and their know. backups are hitting, hitting shots. I mean, yep. uh, Hot team. And, scary team, scary team. You think they yeah, get it done not, against the Zags? Yeah. Gonzaga is not losing though. Okay. Got yeah. I, I can't, they look so good. I mean, they just look so good right now. I'm, I'm actually shocked. I, I, I didn't think Creighton would, necessarily be in the game but they literally were not in the game at all i mean gonzaga's just looked really good i think they're going to push the tempo a little bit too much for usc um and usc can score a lot but i'm still not sold that their defense is high high level they're going to try to stretch mobley out a little bit i i i think gonzaga is going to figure this out even though i do think it might be a little closer than uh, some may expect i got the trojans with the upset Wow. Some some up live. I like their energy on the bench. I liked the body language. I think they're locked in. I doubted them. I mean, they're they're a really like Oregon 
made really tough contested shots. That zone for USC moves really well, and they got long wingspans. I think on a short turnaround, I think it's going to be trouble for the Zags. I I, I just have a feeling that USC is going to win this game. I, I would say if there was more preparation, the Zags would win it. But uh, I think on the short turnaround, the Zags are – they're vulnerable, and I, I really think that USC front court's gonna gonna do a lot of damage to to um, to, to Gonzaga up front. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's their weakness. I mean, West Virginia kind of exposed them, you know, when when they had Oscar Shibway and and Culver, and you know, really, I thought outplayed them in the front court. Gonzaga ended up winning that game by five, uh, but uh, I, I think the Zags are, are you know, I, I put them on upset alert for sure. Okay, then the next one is um, Michigan and UCLA. You got you got the. Uh, I can't. I, I'm. I don't think UCLA is that good. I'm right. shocked they beat Alabama. Right. Honestly, they just are having a nice run. I got. I got to go Michigan. They, Michigan looks really good. Yep. Even without livers, which is pretty shocking. I'm going Michigan, and right now I'm leaning towards the USC Baylor final, and. Uh, Wow. It's not going to be an easy one to win. I mean, USC is playing some terrific basketball right now and a uh, scary team. But uh, right now I'm, I'm going to say USC Baylor looks like uh, they're on a collision course for the final. final I got Zags Baylor. Uh, I, I want that. I want, the I want the, I want the real, real one versus two. Right. In the, in the championship. Right. I agree with you. Well, I hope that happens. I hope the Zags win, but I'm going to, I'm going to pick USC. Anything else before we sign off? I think that's it. I'm excited for this one, though. This is a big one. Uh, Elite Eight, chance to go to the first Final Four uh, under Scott Drew, and I guess in Baylor modern history, right? First Final Four? Yep. Yeah. But when's the last time you were in Indianapolis? Um, I was in Indy do, 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 for a wedding a little less than, I guess it was over a year ago with COVID. So, yeah, yeah. it was probably a year and a half ago. Man, we ate at this restaurant last night that was so good called the Eagle. Have you Never heard about been. this place? Mm-mm. It's like, have you ever eaten at Babes in Dallas? Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like Babes, but it's better. Like, it's like wow. mostly fried chicken dishes. I had the uh, fried chicken BLT, but the seasoning and the chicken was so good. And I'm not a huge fried chicken guy. And I was like blown away, you know, the, the, uh, the collard greens, the horseradish mashed potatoes, the mac and cheese. I think Jason King would be proud of me for, for uh, somebody had recommended this restaurant and I'm glad we did it. We did it, you know, before going to the Oregon USC game. And, and I, I just want to give a shout out to the wow. Eagle. Terrific place. That's, yeah, that's awesome. I, well, I might be there in a few days if Baylor wins. Let's do it. I'll be up there, but um yeah, you know, I, there is a place that I really like. And it's not like a huge place. And I don't even know if there's one in Indianapolis, you're directly in Indianapolis, but um, it's called Arnie's. Okay. A local, it's a local favorite. The pizza is, I'll stand, I think it's my favorite pizza on this planet. So if you ever. The Arnie's. One, huh? Okay. The, Arnie's. the Arnie's. It's just Arnie's. Arnie's. Okay. Yeah. Arnie's. And I'll look it up. Yeah, and it used to be uh, they split from Pizza King, but Pizza King's uh, like a big kind of uh, fast foodie type thing. I think they're different, but if if there is no Arnie's and you can get Pizza King, it's somewhat similar. Is 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 it a brick oven pizza? Like, is it the um, or it's, is it like it's thin crust? Thin crust, and it's okay. in squares, and okay. it is phenomenal. And if you want to be healthy, their salads are amazing too. If you get an Arnie's Junior, <laughs> get an Arnie's Junior with either blue cheese thousand island or ranch and then a pizza and it's just oh so good good stuff huh yeah there's a place in maryland uh that i used to eat at all the time called lito's pizza sounds similar where they where it's like it's like a rectangle and they cut it into little squares is what you're saying it's a circle and they cut it oh a circle and they cut it into squares okay gotcha yeah yeah the corner pieces are the best the tiny ones yeah all right (laughs) good stuff well, you've been listening to a Sikkim 365 podcast with Ashley Hodge and Grayson Grunhafer. Sikkim Bears.